Um, we've seen in the US the weaponisation and politicisation of mask wearing. In Australia, politician Craig Kelly has raised questions about COVID treatments, including the use of a hydroxychloroquine. Media personalities such as Pete Evans have raised questions about the efficacy of COVID vaccinations and vaccination programs more broadly. So my question to the panel is, in such a politically charged environment, what can be done to reach people who oppose the vaccination program, especially given that many anti-vaxxers are well-educated and use research to justify their opposition? Tony. That's a big question. That's a Difficult one. Uh, I agree with Nick here that you've got to do the education so that people come along with you. Um, the Kellys of this world, uh, thankfully in Australia, that's a very small part of our political pie, as it were. So at least we've got that position of strength there. Um, I think countries like Australia, but more of a social democracy, have done better at not politicising the wearing of masks. Uh, see the way New South Wales took it up so quickly. So I don't think we've got as much a problem there on the politicisation of it. As far as reaching out to anti-vaxxers, that's challenging. My approach to that is that you've got to be straight up. You've got to present those results from the international trials that show the side effects are low. But you also have to be open to the possibility that there will occasionally be side effects and sometimes serious side effects and be honest about that and thoroughly investigate incident, in, incidences when they happen. So just finishing up there, you know, it will happen that 10 days after somebody's vaccinated, they'll get an autoimmune disease or something like that, and there'll immediately be questions. In all likelihood, they were going to get it anyway. But you still need to take that seriously, investigate it, and then look for the evidence from all the trials across the world. That's how I would approach it. But Sharon can, Moon, can how I troubled have you... I just want to oh. gauge how troubled you've been about the promotion or the, by the promotion of hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, I mean, mis you're just talking about the problems with misinformation and trying to, you know, digest selective, selective um, digestion of, of what's out there and making a very strong conclusion about the treatment. Well, um, Craig Kelly can't prescribe hydroxychloroquine and you won't get a single doctor around the country that's going to do it, but it does spread misinformation and, and promote fixed beliefs. And I think we've got to... You, the government's got to put out clear and consistent communication, doctors and scientists do, but I really think... For vaccination, we need to embrace community leaders and people that can really influence and speak the same language as the very diverse group that we want to want to vaccinate. And, and just I think today, that's going to be very in the important. JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine, hydroxychloroquine randomised trial, trial mm -hmm. multiple countries around the world, yeah. no effect. Yeah. So, so, what's the answer though when you have a public figure like an elected politician that's spruiking this stuff? I think I just Is said it. it. No effect. <laughs> Trials all around the world. Um, and that's what the message we need to get out but, there. But that, that's not going to shut up some people. Well, and they have there'll, big there'll, there'll yeah. always be the 1%, like always be the 1 yeah. like that. Yeah. And it's important that they see that 99% of us read the journals or convey that, that message. And the science says this. No effect of hydroxychloroquine. Dr Coatsworth, how do you get that message through to Paleo Pete? Uh, yeah, well, you don't. I mean, I, I, honestly, I, I mean, I, th I you, think... You just give up on, on speaking to, to him? I, I think you have to, because there are a certain um, group who are promoting this message who... It doesn't matter how many times uh, I talk to them, they're not going to change. So what we have to do through shows like this, um, through the government advertising campaign, through direct conversation, is find the people who are seeking their information from... Paleo Pete, uh, and um, d divert their, or, or bring them into the credible um, conversations, the credible news sources that we're putting out through health.gov.au. But also, it's going to be word of mouth. It's going to be the successful vaccination rollout. It's going to be demonstrations of safety um, and effectiveness in our own community. That will build momentum of itself as well. Personally, I look forward to everyone being vaccinated. But I know that there's a lot of people who fear the vaccine or believe that the government might have another agenda behind the vaccination process. Some of this is due to the vaccine being developed faster than any has before. Um, with the news today that the AstraZeneca vaccine has been linked to some blood clotting and that those of us under 50 have to take the or should have been advised to take the Pfizer vaccine instead, what are the government's plans to persuade those that are he vaccine hesitant or afraid to take the vaccine um, to take the vaccine in order to reach herd immunity for everyone else? All right. Trent. 
Well, um, thanks for that question. And I think that uh, it is an important issue that we face. But the first thing I'd say is that the vaccine is the world's way, Australia's way out of the pandemic. And we're not going to get uh, back to anything like our normal existence until uh, we have a large proportion of the Australian community that have been vaccinated. Uh, it has been a miracle of modern medicine and science that we've been able to develop the range of vaccines that the world has available to it um, over the last 12 months. It's fair to say 12 months ago, uh, there were many that doubted that we'd be at this point. And I think we can be extraordinarily proud of our science community wherever they are in the world and including here in Australia. Uh, I think what is important to recognise is that in a vaccination program like this, safety comes first. And what we've seen today is uh, following some uh, advice from and some uh, analysis from our European friends, uh, a very precautionally, uh, an abundantly cautious approach uh, to the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, but safety will always be the primary consideration and that's what's going to happen uh, as we continue the rollout of the vaccine. Uh, undoubtedly, though, this throws Australia's vaccine rollout into disarray. This is what the Prime Minister said during his press conference tonight. Task now, over, over, overnight and through the course of... Uh, T tomorrow and over the weekend there will be a recalibration of how the program um, will need to be adjusted to take it into account uh, the decision the government has taken tonight to accept those recommendations from a target. Um, as the Health Minister has just said, uh, there are of course um, Pfizer vaccines uh, that, that are in Australia um, and we are getting a regular supply of those and they can be prioritised against the individuals for whom that will be the more appropriate vaccine for them. But we will just have to work through the logistics of that and the calibration of how that is done and, uh, and that will be our task now. Uh, this is a very big moment for Australia, isn't it? Well, it's a big moment for the world because AstraZeneca is the vaccine that the majority of the world is going to use and uh, uh, that has consequences if this advice is adopted by other countries as well. But um, the first thing I'd say is, is that um, the incident of this blood clotting is incredibly low. We're talking about six at max in every million people. So is it um, an overreaction to do this? No, I think that particularly to um, respond to that type of vaccine hesitancy um, that we talked about before, it's really important that we actually make clear to the community transparently that we're putting safety as number one priority. Um, what's important to note though is, is that it will continue the rollout for over 50s. We're in phase 1B and 1A which is uh, in terms of the 6 million people in 1B, people over 70, so they'll be able to continue to receive it. Uh, 2A, which some of us might be in for over 50s, um, it will be able to continue with AstraZeneca as well. And we have 20 million doses of Pfizer um, that are coming regularly, um, obviously not in one block, but will continue to come through the year. And we've got 50 million doses of Novavax, which will come later in the year if it passes all of the tests. I want to go to the rest of the panel, but I just want to gauge how many in our audience are impacted by this. So now if you're under 50, you won't be recommended the AstraZeneca vaccine, you'll be prioritised for Pfizer. So who's under 50 here tonight? So this is the vast majority of our audience. I think there's someone here, Elise, you had the jab today. You're under 50, that's right? Yes, yeah. And you're essentially a frontline worker. Um, which one did you get? AstraZeneca. So how do you feel about the news? Oh, it would have been nice to get it 24 hours ago, but I mean, I'm, I don't regret getting vaccinated. I think it's important to do. Hopefully everything will be OK. OK. Uh, Annika, this is a pretty difficult moment for Australia, isn't it? We banked a lot on AstraZeneca. It is. And I think Trent's right in that we are all on a unity ticket and that we all want this to succeed. You know, we all want this to work. And Australians really um, set the, the global standard in looking after one, one another, locking down in a way that reduced our COVID numbers. And our reward for that was meant to be that we would be able to get back on track and, you know, um, for our economy, for us to maybe get the jump start on other countries where it wasn't going so well. Um, and now all that is in jeopardy and it feels like we're failing at the first hurdle and that's because our government, uh, the, the first, very first difficulty of procurement, um, we don't seem to have any um, clear direction or answers about that. It comes to, I think, the Prime Minister ju judgment about the the vaccines that he chose, the numbers of those doses and why. Um, when the UK, the US chose other pathways like Moderna or Johnson & Johnson. Are you saying we've backed the wrong horse with AstraZeneca, putting so much e effort into it? We've been saying since last year that we need more horses in the race. We need five or six different vaccines. We've got um, five. We've we invested in five. 
well, if they're coming down the line, things like Novavax are months and months and months away. And I think Sarah's right. People are worried. I had a mobile office this morning in Deegan. People were talking about their concerns. We had a snap lockdown in Brisbane last week. Um, but things like JobKeeper, we were told by the Treasurer that the timing of that was based around the vaccine rollout being well underway by now. That's not the case. But job, JobKeeper payments got cut off last Sunday. Yesterday, Prime Minister Morrison suggested that advice from Otagi had slowed the vaccine rollout indicating that the target was now making decisions normally reserved for government ministers. Is the government actually running the vaccine rollout? Is the government taking responsibility for the vaccine rollout results? Or is it being left to the faceless men and women of the target? From beautiful Achuka, very noisy Achuka as well, <laughs> Mary-Louise McClaws, we'll start with you. What did, the, what, what did the Prime Minister do in, and say in relation to Otagi? What did it mean to you? Well, Otagi gave the right decision that um, those under 60 need to understand that the data on um, adverse events hasn't changed. Uh, then the federal government wants people to use the AstraZeneca because we don't have enough Pfizer. And so I think there's a bit of um, blaming, shifting of blame uh, towards Atagi, where in fact Atagi is basically saying the data hasn't changed and that really anybody who's already had a Pfizer, yes, go and get another one. But really we should be um, using Pfizer and the young ones. And I just remind you that the AstraZeneca uptake has slowed down for dose one for people 60 to 69. So they're the group that really, are, for some reason, have got a bit confused about having AstraZeneca because the 70 and over have had dose one and two. So I, I think that all of this has caused a great deal of confusion in the community. There's been many changes of advice from uh, Atagi Mukesh. Yes. And, uh, and of course, the, the issue of uh, indemnifying yes. GPs like you in giving the AstraZeneca to a slightly younger cohort has been a live one. Uh, look, we um, have been advising on this since January. We knew the vaccines were going to come. We needed to be ready for this. We had a whole lot of things that we've talked to government to say, these are the things you need to do. One of which was actually to say, uh, there should be some indemnity uh, in the situation, especially if there were going to be mishaps. But you've got it now, haven't you? Well, no. So it's been promised. It's been an announcement. Right. Uh, but nothing's come through. OK. And what uh, Marie Lou is saying is absolutely right. The advice hasn't changed. Um, and uh, advice has changed, and we need to stick with the medical advice, and this is what it is. Mm. Yes, there is opportunities for people who are not 60 to get the vaccine, mm. but you always had to get that conversation, and the Prime Minister was right, with your doctor, um, and then make sure that you do that. But we're getting people in their you know, 80s, 18s and 20s and 25 saying, I want a, uh, that vaccine. And that's not a reasonable thing to be doing. And so you, so you, you wouldn't vaccinate someone? No, I won't. In my practice, I won't vaccinate anybody under 60. Until with AstraZeneca? See, with AstraZeneca, until I see that, uh, uh, that uh, policy in place. I would then do it with that conversation not can, I, can I just jump in yeah. there? So the indemnification is one thing, which sort of yeah. protects you legally then, should there be uh, a suit that arises from an adverse effect. But what about the cons medical concern itself about uh, vaccinating someone that young with AstraZeneca? Do you have that concern? Yes, I would. Uh, so I'd be, I'd be really concerned about somebody who's even under 40. Um, and again, a whole I'd... lot of people I know in their 20s, when the Prime Minister said that the other week, said, yes. you know, go and talk to your GP. A whole bunch of people I know went and got AstraZeneca straight away. Yep. They're fine, they're good, which is great to hear, and they had no hesitation doing it. Well, we had a lot of people at the very beginning. We started vaccinating 22nd of, right. of March, and most, well, none of the people that touch wood we've had have had any problems. And we know it's a very small number of people who are going to get problems. And the other thing we have learned is that we know what to watch out for. And if you know what to watch out for, you get in early, you can do something about it. But the, the, we, we actually need to um, use the, the Pfizer for the people under, under 60 at the moment. If we do go down to 55 or 50, as we were doing with the previous mm. lockdown, uh, there needs to be that conversation. There is a risk. It's not a big risk, but there is a risk. Uh, and people uh, who may have a misadventure should be looked after by government if there's an issue. It's their program. They've bought it. They've sponsored it. They said they're going to pay for it with a, a no-fault conversation. Well, let's see Please if give indemnification comes through. Alison, you're sitting here and you can't get anything, right? Well, no. And also, young people are... They form the largest portion of the, the workforce that moves around a lot, right? Yeah. And we pay also taxes and... 
keeps the healthcare system going. We'll get to you eventually. <laughs> stop, stop fussing. <laughs> Better raise the flag, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I watched the Q&A program last week or the week before and there was a really great question from uh, a bloke called Tristan and he asked, and I think he represented a lot of young people as well as I did, which was just, what can I do to make this better? I'll take a risk if it's going to ensure that we, as a, as a policy, can collectively move out of these lockdowns and these problems, we can move onto the horizon. And the, the response from the, the experts on the panel was that on a health front, there are more risks to you of taking AstraZeneca and it's better that you vote. You wait for, for Pfizer. And then on a policy front, you going out and taking that vaccine isn't going to change the timelines. Would you take AstraZeneca? I, as soon as Morrison did that presser, I was one of those people on every yep. for, place I could go looking for it. And then I watched the program and I also um, I followed Atagi's advice. I'm also the daughter of a registered nurse and <laughs> I, I respect the public healthcare system and in a time of, you know, Trumpian attacks on all of our you know, important institutions, I, I'm just going to follow that advice. And there's also research I know that's come out today that shows that is, um, you know, reinforced by uh, uh, research that shows that young people are more at risk of blood clots than they would. Um, Which but is if, you, if hence, I have COVID on my... Advice, if, yeah. COVID, if I was in Sydney, I would be getting AstraZeneca. Yes, I was just going to say that there's um, evidence that AstraZeneca works very well, or Pfizer. How, and, and that was from the UK when they were looking at uh, the impact from vaccinating young people uh, from December to the end of March. Problem is that that was with Alpha, and now there's Delta. Delta's twice as infectious. And we do know from Qatar and from uh, other areas that uh, AstraZeneca seems to have at least a... Ooh, 20 percentage point lower vaccine, uh, vaccine efficacy, uh, even with that second dose for symptomatic infection. And in people like Alison and, um, and Michelle, they yeah. are young enough yeah. to be able to transmit it. And we want them to have a great um, immune response uh, so that they don't get symptomatic infection yeah. and therefore their uh, viral load is lower and that they're less likely to keep spreading it in the community. I'm a registered nurse of 38 years' experience. I'm currently not vaccinated against COVID. I have worked in emergency, coronary and intensive care, medical, surgical, rural and remote, and for 23 years as a midwife, delivering and caring for babies and their mothers. I now find myself to be almost a pariah amongst my peers and unable to apply for positions in healthcare due to mandatory vaccination requirements. Do you think this is fair, given that all healthcare staff treat all others as infectious and are themselves treated as infectious? Thank you. Dinesh, let me start with you on this one. Does it surprise you there are healthcare workers who don't want to be vaccinated? Is this a, a common thing? And, and what would you say to a nurse like Ivan about it? I have come across um, healthcare workers that are um, worried about getting vaccinated. And I think uh, we've always had compulsory vaccinations. When I first started working as a doctor or even a medical student, I had to provide evidence of a number of vaccinations and immune status. So it's always been a thing. Um, I think right now we're, we're in a really difficult position, but there are a couple of interesting things. I was talking to a very senior colleague of mine who said that um, apart from making things uh, compulsory, he had a few human level conversations with some colleagues about the topic and it changed the direction. So I think conversations are important. And I guess the other thing is that some of these issues are being tested in the courts at the moment. And when we can't come to an agreement between the employers and people, that's where it has to be tested and we'll probably get an answer for that. Simon, where do you stand on mandatory vaccinations in various sectors, particularly the healthcare sector? Well, the first thing is I would never, ever have used the word mandatory or compulsory. These vaccinations are not mandatory, they're not compulsory, they are conditions that people have to meet for a range of activities, including employment. I'll come back to that. The first thing I wanted to say, though, is I really felt for Ivan and his comment that he's treated as a pariah. One of the things I hope we can avoid doing is ridiculing or uh, ignoring or certainly 
uh, demonising people who either choose or are particularly choose uh, not to be vaccinated. That's, that's not the way to deal with it. Their, their concerns ought to be taken very seriously. But in doing so, and, and, and treating them with the kind of respect for their intrinsic dignity and the kind of choice that Ivan wants to make, that doesn't mean that we should say, well, just come and do whatever you happen to feel like because you're concerned. If, and this is the thing I, I'm not really qualified to talk about, if there really is a serious reason to require vaccination for the health and safety of the people that Ivan wishes to care for, then one of the conditions that he has to meet to do that today, in today's world, which is different to the 20 plus years he spent, may be that issue of vaccination. And if he chooses not to be vaccinated, then he's also choosing not to meet the conditions by which he can continue. And this is, an, in some senses, an entirely unremarkable thing. Uh, airline pilots reach a point where conditions change, where if they don't undertake their testing and if, they have, if their eyesight starts to go, they have to discontinue what they've been doing over many, many decades in some cases because they don't meet the conditions. And I think if we took the heat out of it by not seeing it as about compulsion mm. or mandate, but rather about these are the conditions, only those which are strictly necessary, making provision where we can for those who can't or won't take that so that they're not excluded, but at the same time absolutely reserving the right to make that prudential judgment, then I think we're in a better position. But let's not ridicule or make people like Ivan feel a pariah. With less than 5% 5 5 of people from low-income countries fully vaccinated, what meaningful steps is Australia taking to promote vaccine equity from our booster-filled ivory tower. Jane Holton, this uh, sounds like one right up your alley. Uh, what are we doing, what should we be doing when it comes to helping our region with vaccines? Look, thank you so much for that question. And you're right, low-income countries, it's actually 4.7% of people in low-income countries have had one or more doses. That is a disgrace. And if you look in Australia, if you look across our whole population, and it's great that we are where we are in terms of vaccine coverage. Uh, we're in front of the UK, we're in front of the United States, and that's fantastic. It's going to give us freedoms. But we have to help, we have to do our bit to ensure that the rest of the world gets vaccinated. Now, it's good we're donating doses, and I'm really pleased with that. We're working with partners, and we're actually thinking not just about shipping vaccines, but thinking about the last mile, how we get vaccines into arms. Our near neighbour, Papua New Guinea, our good friends literally just across the top of the Torres Strait, you're looking at 2%. Now, it's complicated, it's difficult geographically, but we have to work and help our neighbours to get the same kind of health outcomes. Globally, 53% have had one or more doses. African countries, if you look at Ethiopia, it's sitting on about 3%. It's actually not good enough. And particularly as we start using boosters, there's good health reasons to boost with these vaccines, but it doesn't mean we should actually ignore low-income countries. We have to do our bit. Well, I was going to ask and, you that. Uh, I'm working hard to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, sorry to interrupt there, but we, we are donating, what is it, 7 million so far, 20 million have pledged till mid-next year, 40 million by the start of 2023. 60 in total, that's right. Yeah, is it, is it either or when it comes to whether we should use them for boosters here or give more to developing countries? Ultimately, does it become a, a choice of one or the other, or can we... You know, whenever, whenever you ask someone in government about this, so we'll, we'll do both, boosters here and, and we'll donate to the region. Well, look, one of the things we can do, of course, is think about the AstraZeneca production capacity in Melbourne. Now, they're busy at the moment producing other sorts of vaccines. Can we contribute to global manufacturing? We probably should. Can we work with our Indian colleagues who have not been exporting for some period to actually get more exports out of India? So I do think we can walk and chew gum, but we have to walk and chew gum. We can't just look after ourselves. And it's worth remembering that there are health consequences here. If there are new variants, particularly in countries where vaccine rates are very low, we all know that a variant like Delta, which started um, in the Indian subcontinent, it rapidly ran right around the world. So none of us are immune. It's in all of our interests. But you know what? It's also the ethical, equitable, right thing to do. And we do have to, as a, a rich country, turn our mind to this and make this happen. Most of my relatives and friends work in either construction or traffic control. They live in the Fairfield LGA and they've been forced 
to either take annual leave or they've got no work. And $750 from the government just isn't going to cut it. We don't have the luxury of working from home. My uncle, for instance, has a wife and kids to look after and a mortgage to pay. On top of that, there is so much police right now in Fairfield and there are choppers in the air every couple of hours. It feels like we're being treated like criminals. We are so frustrated, we are angry, and we are so depressed. When is the government going to end this lockdown, get the police out, and, and now the army out, and allow us to get back to work? So very frustrated and angry, Ron Al there. And Mohammed Ahmed, I'll, I'll start with you. Does that reflect any of the feeling you're picking up where you are? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, that question is complicated. Uh, I, I'm going to have to answer it from two ends. So firstly, uh, we have to talk about it from people's individual responsibilities during a, a crisis. Um, the other day, a gentleman that I read about tested positive for COVID, but still thought it was a good idea to go out and um, buy a pair of dumbbells. Because, you know, during a global pandemic, the most important thing in the world is the size of your biceps. Um, we have to recognise that this is an incredibly serious situation. And um, the person that I've been thinking a lot about lately is Dr Jamal Reefy, who um, is a, a doctor in, um, in Belmore. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was present uh, when my grandmother passed away in 1997. He was there for her last breaths. And since then, he's been looking after my mum and dad into their senior years. He's been looking after uh, me and my five siblings, and he's looking after our kids. I'm not asking the people in Western Sydney or anywhere else in the country to listen to our politicians. I actually understand that they've let us down, that they've confused us. In many ways, they've betrayed us. But I am asking you to listen to the doctors in your neighbourhoods who have been looking after our families for generations. Mohammed, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for one yep. second. I just want to quickly hear from the panel, but it's interesting to hear that, that slightly different take, I guess, on the situation that Ron and others and you find yourselves in. Chris Bowen, your response to Ron? Yeah, thanks, Virginia. I certainly understand what is motivating Ron's comments. Uh, but uh, Mohammed is right. We do need to follow the medical advice. The medical advice is that lockdowns work. But certainly I think that um, in Fairfield's case, it has been tough. And I think a lot of people have misunderstood throughout wider Sydney what Fairfield has been dealing with. Uh, a lot of well-meaning journalists asked me at the beginning of this, why are the people of Fairfield still moving about? You know, why aren't they getting the, the message? It's not about getting the message. We have a very industrialised workforce, a heavily construction and transport focused workforce. People can't work from home. And it has not been just good enough to say work from home. A lot of people, the vast majority of people in my community cannot work from home. I'm very glad that the economic support was lifted yesterday. I'd still like to see a modified JobKeeper back um, because that is the simplest way of getting people off the Centrelink queues. I was at the mm. Fairfield Centrelink office yesterday. The queues have not reduced since the lockdown began because the situation is very complicated. And the frustration for construction workers, I understand, of course, we'll support um, and implement all the health orders, but, you know, construction workers can't go to work in Fairfield. We probably have the healthiest construction workers in Australia being tested every three days. Um, and it's pretty frustrating that they can't go to work when other people in supermarkets, et cetera, can. So there needs to be a lot more clarity. And as for the announcement of the military tonight, well, um, local members haven't been consulted or informed as to what role they'll be playing. And if the military is going to play a role, I would suggest that community leaders and MP MPs need to be brought on, um, on deck pretty quickly to explain what role the military will be playing. Because Ron is right. I mean, there's a Polair helicopter over the top of my house four times a day. I understand what stress that provides. And military on the street, if not very sensitively and carefully handled, would add to that tension. Let's go to Clover Moore, because I, I guess, Clover, it's your job to tell Ron that, um, as Chris Bowen indicated, because he's in one of those eight lockdown local government areas, even though construction is returning, he can't go to work. No, and it's, uh, I think what, was, what he described is the very grim scene and, and people are really, um, are, are really anxious and um, the $750 is, isn't going to, to do it. Um, and, and really, you know, what we need is everyone to get vaccinated so that uh, the lockdown uh, can, can, can be lifted. And, I mean, that, that's just the answer to all of this. And I think people feel really um, 
failed by, by government, by the federal government, for not getting that vaccine out to people and not communicating to them that it was absolutely essential that people get vaccinated. I mean, to think that, um, you know, the people who are now dying are, are unvaccinated and to think 25 per cent of people over 70 are not vaccinated just means there has been totally inadequate communication. And I think that this is what the people of Fairfield must be, be feeling. They're, they're being told now to stay at home and they have jobs that clearly aren't desk jobs. Uh, and and they're, they're, they're totally angry and frustrated. Um, and, and yet, you know, the vaccination message just simply hasn't got out there. And that's because the vaccination hasn't been here. Um, you know, there's been a slight increase over the last week, but only 18 per cent of people are vaccinated now. And we need to get to 80 per cent before we can go back to normal. So what are we going to say to the person who called in? You're going to have an awful lot of t long time to wait if we're going to have to get to 80 per cent. So I think the situation is grim. There's no other way to describe it. Um, and, and really, I hope the federal government, uh, I hope the prime minister's listening, because he's really got to get his act together and get that vaccination to us. And the thing I'd ask him to do is get on the phone to President Biden. You know, we're the, we're the willing ally. We go to war when the US wants us to go to war. You know, we're, we're you know, in a, what was just described in Fairfield as a type of war zone. And, and that's how many people feel. We okay. need the vaccine. Let, vaccine. Let, me, let, me go to, let me go to Senator Bragg, who's representing the government tonight. And there's a fair bit in that for you, Senator. Well, I mean, Ron... I mean, the, the first duty of government uh, is to look after its citizens. And when a government closes down a business, it needs to compensate that business. Now, if you're a sole trader, uh, if you're a, uh, a sparky or an electrician or you're a, a builder, I mean, uh, there are payments there. Um, I accept that the 1000 bucks a, a week for a sole trader is only going to be a temporary um, stopgap. I mean, I think there is more that we will have to do once we get through this pandemic uh, to help construction and to help traders get back on their feet. And, look, it's all well and good for people um, who have desk jobs to say, look, they can work from home. I mean, it's easy to walk into your kitchen table and put your computer down, but, I mean, many people like you, Ron, can't actually um, work from home. So I think we have a very heavy duty that we owe to you. Uh, but it is most important now, as Clover says, that we get on board with the vaccination. Uh, 200,000 in the last day, which is a record, mm. uh, including 80,000 in New South Wales. So. Whilst New South Wales is currently dealing with a very serious outbreak, um, on this uh, track, we're going to be the first out and the first to freedom. Deborah Cheatham. Well, I agree with much that has been said, and I just want to say to Ron, we really feel your pain. Uh, we've been through that here in, in Melbourne. Lockdown is a necessary but a blunt tool. And it, uh, it has a long tail. The industry I'm in, for instance, the arts industry, lockdown has a very long tail for us. And uh, many of my colleagues were not eligible for payments during that very long period last year and in the ensuing lockdowns this year. It is... The only way out is vaccination. And we need the federal government to step up and do the one job that has been given in this crisis, and that is to roll out the vaccination to Australian citizens. As a community leader and a charity worker, I'm deeply offended and appalled by the ongoing lockdown at mainly migrant communities in the southwest and western Sydney. My question is, are we hurting our nation's proud multiculturalism and harmony? What will we, the next generations think? How we treated our own as second-class citizens? One side of Sydney is thrown to the ground for not wearing a mask and the other side is let loose to enjoy life. We need to show solidarity within New South Wales. This just doesn't pass the pub test. No. Mm. Um, I think I think Amara is right and I think this th there is this postcode privilege, right? And some of... I mean, a lot of this existed well before COVID and what we've seen happen during this pandemic is those... those uh, it's just being brought into sharp focus. So some of the issues that you brought up Dave and you know we talked about this. The, this idea of uh, they are battling. There are there is an undergrad. I, I think there is a, two two sort of societies being created here, and I'm not at all suggesting that this is easy to get right from a policy perspective. Mm. It's incredibly difficult. I acknowledge that, and I don't envy those who have to make these decisions. However, um, this roadmap out has to be an inclusive roadmap. It needs to take in, into account there are in, entrenched inequities across multiple 
multiple communities, including the Indigenous community? And how do we ensure that we bring everyone on the journey um, so that by the end of this, the entrenched inequities that already existed, um, you know, they're just going to be far worse? And how are we going to tackle it at that point? Carl, how do we deal with that when we know that different parts of the city have different rates of, of COVID infection? Um, and we know that in the higher rates, uh, there is a, a, an also a, a proportionate response to that. We saw in the northern beaches of Sydney last year at Christmas, they were locked down during Christmas when the rest of the city could move around. If, as Mariam says, you're going to move to a lockdown, an inclusive lockdown, how do you do that when we already see that parts of regional New South Wales that have come out of lockdown are back into lockdown because there's been another outbreak? Yeah, look, it's, it's been tough, and I, and I admit that the Premier's got a tough job, but the reality is having a tale of two cities isn't one in all in, isn't we're all in this together, which is what she's been preaching. We, we're seeing people uh, in my community stigmatised now by other parts of Sydney, something that they can't get work, they're losing contracts because no-one wants to, to hire a, a plumber or an electrician from my part of Sydney because they might have COVID. I mean, we have high case numbers because 80% of our workforce in the 12 yes. local government areas are the essential workers that are servicing Greater Sydney. 80% stand. So and they're I, having to move around. They're moving and around and they're, and they're either catching the virus when they're at work or they're coming home and, and spreading it or vice mm. versa. But, but the discrimination where we're mandating a vaccination for, for a tradie that lives in the in the local government area hotspot and and not if they don't and then they're working on the same site they're working next to each other but there's different rules for different people mm -hmm. and that really irks my community it makes us angry that we're being treated this way we had a curfew that the premier by her own admission said doesn't work and then she brings it in for half of sydney or for 2.2 million people it was arbitrary it didn't work we had helicopters flying overhead waking people up I mean, it's just not... It wasn't fair to begin with, and I'm glad that she's lifted that curfew. Otherwise, maybe I wouldn't have been here tonight. Mm. <laughs> Thank you all again for being Thank part you. of this. That's all we have time for. Thanks to our fantastic studio audience for being here tonight and for all of your questions. Uh, it's been a real treat to have you back in the room. So stay safe. Good night. <laughs> Good night.